Ladies and gentlemen, our presentation will begin shortly. As a courtesy to our presenters and other members of the audience, please take this moment to switch all electronic devices to silent mode. Thank you.
My desk is on the seventh floor. If you need anything, you can call me. Make sure to keep your ID with you because you're going to need to badge in every time you re-enter. Cafeteria is on the fourth floor, and we generally take lunch about 1230. Whoa. This is where I'm sitting? For now, yeah. With the big move coming up, it's kind of crazy around here. I promise it's only temporary. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that really can't happen. <laughs> Welcome to WWDC. It's great to be back in San Jose, the heart of Silicon Valley and right down the street from Apple in our new campus. It's been 15 years since we held the developer conference in San Jose, and an awful lot has changed. But the one thing that hasn't changed is our commitment to the developer community and our ability to do amazing things together. This is going to be the best and biggest WWDC ever. <laughs> Every year, we host WWDC to bring Apple engineers and our amazing developers together on our collective mission to change the world. And I'm pleased to tell you the Apple developer community has never been more vibrant. We now have 16 million registered developers in the program around the world, and we added 3 million last year alone. We've got 5,300 developers here this morning, our largest group ever. We have attendees this morning from 75 countries across the world. It's truly a worldwide conference. And we had the most student developers with us this morning ever. In fact, one of our youngest is here this morning. His, his name is Yuma Sorianto. He's from Australia and he's just 10 years old. 
He started coding when he was six, and he already has five apps on the App Store. I met Yuma yesterday, and I can't wait to see what he's going to accomplish next. And while we've got some great up-and-coming developers like Yuma, we've got some that got a bit of a later start. Masako. Masako Wakamiya is just 82 years old, and she's from Japan, and she published her first app earlier this year. So, so if you haven't published yet, there is still time. Let's give them a big round of applause. Now let's turn our attention to our four incredible platforms. Of course, as you know, each of them stem from the same core technology, but each is uniquely expressed and designed for the best experience for where they work. We keep pushing these platforms forward, giving you, the developers, powerful tools and opportunities to change the world. That's why this developer conference is so important. Now, we have a lot to talk about today, and I do mean a lot. So I'm dispensing with the updates other than to tell you, Apple's doing great. We have six important announcements to share with you this morning. So let's get right into it, and I'll start with tvOS. We recently introduced the TV app on Apple TV, iPhone, and iPad to create the easiest way to discover and enjoy your TV content from across your video channels, all in one convenient place. We launched it with support from just a handful of video channels, but now we have 50 partners integrated into the TV app. And today, we are really thrilled to announce that Amazon is coming... Amazon is coming to the TV app and, Apple, and all Apple TVs later this year with Amazon Prime Video. And of course, as you know, Prime Video provides a wealth of great content, thousands of TV shows and movies, and some great original content like Transparent, Mozart in the Jungle, Man in the High Castle, and so much more. We are so pleased to welcome Amazon to Apple TV. So that's tvOS. You'll be hearing a lot more about tvOS later this year. Number two, let's talk about Apple Watch. <laughs> Apple Watch has had incredible growth this past year. In fact, it's the number one selling smartwatch by far. And what's most important to us is that it's number one in customer satisfaction Again, by far. Apple Watch is designed to help you live a healthier life, and people are absolutely loving the fitness capabilities, the health capabilities, the quick access to information, and even the ability to swim with it. We've got some exciting updates to the Watch OS, and to take you through them, I'd like to invite Kevin Lynch up. Kevin? Thank you, Tim. So watchOS is moving forward really quickly, and I'm very excited to introduce watchOS 4 today. This furthers the areas that people love and also introduces new ways to make the watch more personal to you. Let's start with watch faces. Now, Apple Watch is great for quickly glancing at information, and many people are using a watch face like this today. And now you need to choose what information shows up here. So for example, weather, calendar, and workouts, or maybe you'd like to look at the date and reminders and sunset. The information that you'd like to see actually varies based on time and your location and your routines. What if we could actually show you a selection of information that you might need automatically? Well, Siri is becoming more and more a proactive assistant, knowing what information you need, when you need it. 
And we've created a new watch face, which is powered by Siri intelligence. This is the new Siri watch face. Now, it automatically displays the information that's most relevant to you. And you can also access Siri just by tapping on the new complication on the top left. And it automatically displays this information with the same type of intelligence we've applied on iOS. We're using machine learning to adapt automatically based on your routines and the apps that you use when you use them. So in the morning, I might see, for example, commute time and my first meeting. And if I rotate the crown, I can see more information from Siri. For example, reminders or even photo memories from this same time last year or maybe from this location. And throughout the day, whenever you raise your wrist, the face will dynamically update with information for you. So for example, at noon, I might see a reminder to make a call, and I might get a pass to a flight that I'm taking that afternoon. So relevant passes in wallet can appear here right in the face, including from third-party apps. Now at the end of the day, I might see what time the sun's going to set, and also I can get access to controls I tend to use in the home app at night. So this is an intelligent, proactive assistant right on your wrist, and this is the new Siri face on Apple Watch. Now sometimes you might like kind of less information and more graphics, and that's the soul of the new kaleidoscope face. It displays a beautiful symmetrical pattern that slowly changes throughout the day. And you can rotate the crown and you can get this kind of trippy effect whenever you want. And there's multiple styles you can choose from. So for example, if you use a photo like this, you can create a variety of kaleidoscope styles. This is the new kaleidoscope face. Now, Mickey and Minnie have been a big hit on Apple Watch, and more characters have been working to find their way in. And I'm really excited to welcome Woody and Jesse and Buzz. They're going to be right at home inside the watch, and they're so much fun. And whenever you raise your watch with the Toy Story face, you're going to see a variety of vignettes, kind of like this. <laughs> There's a lot of hijinks going on in there. Um, so these are three really lively new faces in watchOS, Siri face, Kaleidoscope, and Toy Story. Now let's talk about activity. Apple Watch has already been helping many people improve their health and fitness, and activity is one of the most frequently used apps on the watch. In watchOS 4, activity notifications are more personalized to you to help you close your rings more often. So you might start off each day with some inspiration by receiving an update like this. This lets you know if you're close to accomplishing an achievement or what you can do to match yesterday's goals. And these are all personalized to you. And as part of this smarter coaching, we're also introducing monthly challenges. And these challenges are designed to help you either beat or repeat something that you accomplished or came close to doing. And they're all achievable because they're based on your real history. And like every great coach, we want to celebrate your success. So we've added a little bit more fun when you close your rings or earn an achievement. So you'll get smaller celebrations for everyday successes and bigger celebrations for harder to reach milestones. Now we've also enhanced the workout app to be even easier to use and more powerful. Starting with the new UI, where quick starts right up front, you can just tap and go, it's much easier. And customers have really loved the new swimming capabilities in Series 2. And we're now enhancing the pool swim workout with auto sets. So just by taking a rest at the edge of the pool, will automatically mark each set of swimming that you're doing. And at the end, you'll even get your distance for each stroke type and your pace for each set that you're doing. And we also are creating, it's great, the pool swim thing is very popular. We've also created some custom motion and heart rate algorithms for a new workout type called high intensity interval training. Now, this is one of the most popular workouts in the world, so we know it's going to be a favorite for a lot of you when you start using it. Now, if you like to do more than one workout in a row, it's now super easy to just swipe over during a current workout and then add another one by pressing the plus button. So you just press plus, and I can continue with another workout. For example, I might do some outdoor cycling here. I just tap, and I continue. Super easy now to do multiple workouts in a single session. Now, many people are doing the workouts indoors at a gym. And when you use gym equipment, it has data the Apple Watch doesn't have, and the watch has data the gym equipment doesn't have. So you end up with numbers like calories and distance that don't quite match. So in watchOS 4, we've come up with a great solution to this. We're enabling, for the first time, two-way data exchange in real time with gym equipment. So you'll be able to simply tap your Apple Watch on an NFC reader on the gym equipment. Your watch will automatically launch the workout app, and you can connect. And then your heart rate is read by the watch and sent to the equipment. And data like incline and speed is sent from the equipment to your watch. 
And when you start and stop the workout in your gym machine, it does the same thing on your watch. So now all the information matches, it's much easier, and it's a lot more accurate. Now this is being supported by the largest gym manufacturers in the world, who provide about 80% of equipment in gyms today. And Apple Watch enabled equipment will be rolling out starting this fall. Now let's talk about music. Apple Watch paired with AirPods has really become a magical combination. And we're redesigning the music app on Watch to make this a really great experience. With the new music app, we're going to automatically sync music for you based on what you love to listen to. So for example, we'll automatically get your Apple Music mixes, like new music and favorites, freshly updated on your watch. And the app simply presents some beautiful album art and playlist images, and you can just navigate by rotating the digital crown. When you get to the album you like, you can just tap and play. So you can easily play your music now, and we support multiple playlists and music on the watch now. So your music that you love is going to be ready when you are and making Apple Watch and AirPods a truly magical listening experience. That's the new music app. Now let's take a look at this. To give you a quick demo of WatchOS 4, please welcome Vera Carr from the Watch and Health Engineering team. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. I'm so excited to be here. The first thing I want to show you is the new dock. I can now vertically scroll through my recently used apps, like the new music app. Using the dock makes finding the apps I'm looking for easier than ever. Next, let's look at the new intelligent Siri watch face. Here in the warm morning, I could see things like the weather for today and my upcoming events. Later today, I'm heading back to San Francisco to see my parents. And in the afternoon, the Siri face will proactively update to tell me how long it'll take me to get there. Tonight, we're going to see the new Alien movie, which I'm super excited about. No one spoil it for me. For any content in the Siri face, I can tap directly into the app for more details. Here, for example, the Siri face has my tickets, so tonight I can just raise my wrist, and with one tap, they'll be ready. The Siri face also shows me timely content like photo memories and news. Here's a news headline picked for me by the brand new news app now available on Apple Watch. In the app, I can view stunning photos, glance at top news stories throughout the day, and save them for later to be read on my phone. We've also integrated our new activity coaching notifications directly into the Siri face. Now, when it's near the end of your day, or you're close to closing your rings, our coaching algorithms will tell you how much you need to walk to hit your move goal. I did a lot of nervous pacing before this, so now I just need to take a 16-minute walk. Let's close those rings. We've added something new here in Workout that's really cool. Music instantly gets me motivated, and now in WatchOS 4, I can pick a playlist that automatically starts with my workout. Let's do it. And when I'm in a workout, I can quickly swipe to the left and control my music right here. <laughs> These are only a few of the new features in WatchOS 4. I can't wait for you to try it out. Back to Kevin to tell you more. Terrific job, Vera. Thank you. There's a lot more coming in WatchOS 4 including, for example, a new flashlight in the control center, which you can also use as a blinking safety light when you're doing an evening run. There's a lot, lot more happening here. Now, we, of course, have a number of updates that enable great apps by developers in watchOS, including more support for apps running in the background, faster app responsiveness, and some new UI capabilities. And we're also now supporting native core Bluetooth on the watch, which is going to enable experiences for apps that work with small devices around you. So for example, continuous glucose monitoring directly from Dexcom sensor to your watch. Or Zap Tennis, which connects to a sensor on your racket for real-time swing analysis when you're playing. Or Zensor, which connects your watch to your surfboard so you can actually see the height of the waves you're doing and how many calories you're burning while you're still in the water. So lots of new possibilities here for watchOS. <laughs> Developer preview is available today, so you can get going. And there's a free upgrade for everyone across all watches this fall. And that's just some of what's coming in WatchOS 4. Please welcome Tim back to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Tim. 
WatchOS 4 is a great update. Now, let's talk about a product that in many ways is the heart and soul of Apple. And of course, I'm talking about the Mac. There's never been a computer quite like the Mac. The Mac is so important in fueling the world's passion and creativity. It's a computer all of us love to use, and no one can match the Mac's deep integration of hardware and software. And of course, at the heart of the Mac experience is Mac OS. And to tell you about what's next with Mac OS, please welcome Craig Federighi. Craig? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Hey, good morning. Well, let's talk about Mac OS. Now, our current release of Mac OS, of course, is Mac OS Sierra. Now, Sierra brought Siri and Apple Pay to the Mac, let you put your documents and your desktop in the cloud, and even let you unlock your Mac automatically using the watch on your wrist. Now, people are loving Sierra, and we love it too. So we wanted to spend this year perfecting it. But of course, the question is, what do we call it? So we enlisted, once again, our crack marketing team. They were giddy to hop in their minibus and this time venture east, deep into the Sierras, but this time ascending its highest peaks. And when they finally came back, they had a name they said felt really, really good. And it's my privilege to announce for you today, Mac OS High Sierra. <laughs> Now, we talked to the guys and we said there might be, this might be misconstrued, but they assured us this name is fully baked. So, now, High Sierra is all about deep technologies that provide a powerful platform for future innovations on the Mac. But we couldn't help ourselves, we also added some refinements. And it starts with Safari. Now, Safari is known for its efficiency and its legendary battery life. But Safari is also incredibly fast. In fact, we benchmark Safari on the same hardware running Mac OS and Windows with all the popular browsers, and Safari smokes them in benchmark after benchmark. Jetstream, speedometer, motion mark. Safari tops them all. So that's right, Safari is the world's fastest desktop browser with High Sierra. And Safari's domination continues with the new modern version of JavaScript, ECMAScript 5, where you can see Safari delivers 80% faster performance than Chrome. Now, in addition to being tremendously fast, Safari also helps give you a serene browsing experience. Now, you know sometimes you go to read an article, and instead of finding something to read, you get this? Just some loud audio and video that auto plays and disrupts your whole reading vibe? Well, now, don't worry about it because we have autoplay blocking in Safari. <laughs> Safari detects the sites that shouldn't be playing video and puts you in control. You can always push play. Now, Safari is also key in respecting your privacy. Now, have you ever had this experience where you go to buy something on the web, you know, even complete the purchase, and then it seems like everywhere you go on the web, it just follows you around. It kind of feels like you're being tracked, and that's because you are. No longer, because Safari has intelligent tracking prevention. Safari uses machine learning to identify trackers, segregate the cross-site scripting data, put it away, so now your privacy, your browsing history is your own. It's not about blocking ads, the web behaves as it always did, but your privacy is protected. Next, I wanna talk about some refinements to mail, and it starts with search. So in addition to providing searches based on recency, Search in mail is now using Spotlight to identify your top hit. So the message you're looking for is almost always right there at the top. And if you're into using mail in full screen, well now we support split view for your compose window. It's a great way to compose mail. 
And mail is more efficient than ever. It actually uses 35% less disk space for storing your mail. Now, probably our biggest area of refinement in High Sierra is in photos. Yeah. Photos has some great new organization and editing tools. There's a persistent sidebar and a new view that has all your imports in chronological order. And in any view up here in the upper right, you can filter by your keywords, by uh, your favorites, by just media types like video. So it's really easy to get to just what you're looking for. We've also improved faces. It recognizes far more faces automatically using advanced convolutional neural networks. And when you put effort into categorizing and naming people, well, that's now synchronized automatically across all your devices. Now, we also have some great enhancements to editing inside of photos. So you can see here on the right-hand side, all of your editing tools are arrayed. And there are a bunch of great new ones including curves, which allows you to fine tune the color and contrast in your image. And selective color, which lets you modify color in a selective range. And I think you're gonna like this one because if you like to do edits in a pro tool like Pixelmator or Photoshop, well now when you punch out to that other editing tool, all of your edits automatically synchronize right back to your photo library. <laughs> now, Apple pioneered printed books on, based on projects you construct right inside of the photo application. And now we're opening this up to third parties. They're going to offer some amazing new printing services, full framed uh, wall-mounted uh, photos, and even publishing websites all based on projects right inside of photos. So those are some quick refinements, but I want to return to the main story now, and that's technology, because we've gone deep on the fundamentals data, video, and graphics. And when it comes to data, the fundamentals are in the file system. Now, the Mac file system has its roots, actually, HFS, from 30 years ago. Well, a lot has changed since then. We have a lot of flash drives. Our storage is a billion times larger. And it's time for a more modern file system. So I'm pleased to announce that we're bringing the Apple file system to Mac OS as our new default. Now, APFS is a thoroughly modern file system, 64-bit, top to bottom. It's safe and secure with built-in crash protection and native encryption. And it's ultra-responsive with modern features like instant file and directory cloning and high-performance parallelized metadata operations. Now, what does that really mean in practice? Well, let's take a look at a simple file duplication inside of Sierra. So we're going to go up to the file menu. Select duplicate on these very large video files, and it's going to copy. And just like you'd expect, there's a lot of data to be copied here, so it takes a little while. Just about done. There we go. Now let's watch that in High Sierra. Well, we're going to go up to the file menu, we're going to sub duplicate, and we're done. <laughs> Next up, video. Now, the current standard in video is H.264. In fact, H.264 has really enabled the revolution of streaming HD video on the internet. But of course, the game has moved from HD to 4K and 4K high dynamic range video. And there's a new standard to support this. It's H.265 or HEVC. And you want your video to look great, preserve all the detail and color, and HEVC does it while saving up to 40% better compression than H.264. Now, we're building in software encoder support into High Sierra for all Macs and hardware acceleration of HEVC for the newest Macs. And we're also building it into Pro Tools like Final Cut, Motion, and Compressor. Now I want to return to our main story, which is graphics. And graphics are all about the GPU. The GPU has been the performance superstar of the last decade, delivering incredible gains in computational performance. Now, our API for high-performance graphics is Metal, and developers have taken amazing advantage to Metal. This is Dawn of War 3 from Feral Interactive, incredible graphics. This is DaVinci Resolve from Black Magic, which can accel accelerate many editing operations. And of course, we even use Metal inside of Photos for doing machine learning and identifying your photos. But we've learned a lot working with developers on their adoption of metal, 
And we have a new version to announce today. And you'll never guess what we called it. It's Metal 2. <laughs> now, Metal 2 is tremendously fast. In fact, it has great optimizations and new APIs that, when adopted, deliver another 10 times improvement in draw call throughput. Now, some of you remember when Metal first came out, it itself had a 10 times improvement over OpenGL. You can multiply those numbers together. That's 100 times improvement. Now, we've also provided better, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, debugging and performance analysis tools for you to optimize your app for Metal. And we're so excited about the advances in Metal 2 that we've taken the Mac Windows server and put it on top of Metal, accelerating things like mission control. And some of our most challenging system animations are now buttery smooth all the time. Now, Metal is not just about graphics. We're also using it for machine learning. It can now accelerate, yes, we have Metal performance shaders that accelerate all kinds of deep learning algorithms. Now, another piece of Metal news today is metal for external graphics. So you know our MacBooks have this tremendous balance of portability and power. But sometimes, for some workflows, you need even more power. You want to take advantage of the incredible Thunderbolt I.O. on your MacBook Pros to access external graphics. So we're going to be making this possible in Metal 2. Now, we're starting with the developer, developer kit that will be available today. You can actually order a Thunderbolt 3 enclosure with a high-performance AMD GPU and tune your apps for high-performance external graphics. And then we'll be rolling out support to all of our customers in the months to come. Now, with this graphics power, we're really doubling down on our focus on pro content creation. And that's increasingly about VR content creation. And so we're bringing metal for VR to High Sierra. Now, metal is delivering a VR optimized display pipeline that provides extremely high performance. And we're optimizing our pro apps like Final Cut for doing things like editing spherical video right inside the VR environment. We're also working with Valve. They're bringing the Steam VR SDK to the Mac. And we work with Unity and Unreal to bring their engines for VR to the Mac. It's really cool, and you might just be seeing a little bit more from us later today on this topic. So that's a quick look at Mac OS. Some great technologies with the Apple file system, HEVC video, and incredible graphics with Metal 2 support for external graphics and VR support on the Mac, and of course, a bunch of fantastic refinements. Now, macOS High Sierra is available for all of you today as a developer beta, and if you sign up at beta.apple.com, we'll also have a public beta available later this month. And of course, it's shipping to everyone as a free upgrade this fall on all systems that support Sierra. Now, that's your update on macOS High Sierra, and I'm going to turn it over to our Vice President of Hardware Engineering, John Turnus, to tell you more about the Mac. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. So we have some great updates to talk about today that span much of the Mac product line. And let's begin with the iMac. Now, the iMac has been the gold standard of desktops for many years, but we're going to raise the bar once again. And as always on the iMac, it starts with the display. Because the 4K and 5K Retina iMac displays, with their high resolution, excellent brightness, and P3 color gamut, are the best displays on any desktop. But we're going to make them even better. So these new displays are now going to be 500 nits. That's 43% brighter than the previous generation. And for the first time, we're going to support 10-bit dithering, which means these displays can reproduce up to a billion colors. So your content is going to look more true to life than ever before. Now, in addition, we've got some great internal updates for these iMacs. So we'll start with the CPU, because the whole line is moving to Intel's seventh generation core processor, also known as Kaby Lake. Now, Kaby Lake gets us better bass and turbo frequencies for more performance, as well as hardware-based 10-bit HEVC decode which is great for playing back high-quality video. In addition, these iMacs are getting a boost when it comes to memory capacity. 
So the 21.5 inch systems can now be configured with up to 32 gigs of memory. And the 27 inch can go all the way up to 64 gigabytes of memory. Both of those are twice what the previous generation could do. Now fast storage has always been a key part of the iMac. And so we're going to now make our fusion drive standard on all 27 inch configs. And it's also going to be standard on the high end 21.5 inch config as well. In addition, our SSD options are going to be up to 50% faster and now available up to two terabytes. And the iMacs are getting an I.O. upgrade as well, because we're giving them two USB-C connectors which support Thunderbolt 3. And we think our customers, especially our pro users, are really going to love this, because you can do some cool things, like hook up a high-performance RAID array and an external 5K display at the same time. So now let's talk about graphics. And as you heard earlier, we're investing heavily in graphics software technologies like Metal 2. Well, we're also investing in graphics hardware. And every configuration in this new iMac line is going to get a big bump in its graphics performance. So we'll start with the entry-level iMac. Now, this system gets a boost in its integrated GPU by way of Intel's Iris Plus graphics, which now has 64 megabytes of EDRAM. And the performance that we're getting out of this is pretty amazing, because this system is up to 80% faster in graphics than the previous generation. Now, next up is the 21.5-inch iMac with Retina 4K display. And the big news here is that we're going to be moving to discrete graphics and making it standard on all 4K iMacs. And that's going to come, there you go, and that's going to come in this Radeon Pro series GPUs with up to 4 gigabytes of VRAM. And again, this move to discrete graphics yields a pretty spectacular performance increase because this new system is up to three times faster than the previous generation for graphics. Now lastly, we have our 27-inch iMac. And this is our most popular desktop for our pro customers. So obviously, it's going to get a bump in graphics today as well. So it's going to have these Radeon Pro 500 series GPUs with up to 8 gigabytes of VRAM. And again, we get a great performance uplift. In fact, this 27-inch iMac can now deliver up to 5.5 teraflops of graphics compute, which makes it a great platform for VR content creation. In fact, we've seeded some developers with this new iMac and High Sierra so that we can see what they can do with virtual reality on the Mac. And I'm really excited that we can give you a demo of some of this amazing work right now. So I'd like to invite up on the stage here from Industrial Light and Magic is Academy Award winning visual effects artist and chief creative officer, John Knoll. John? Thank you, John. At Lucasfilm's ILMX Lab, story, concept design, and technical development are all intertwined. They come together for us to create immersive experiences for people to enjoy at home, in cinemas, and at theme parks. Now, I've always done my art and development on a Mac, so I'm really excited about these new iMacs. I truly love the platform, so I'm especially, uh, especially excited to be able to share some of our VR content created on these new iMacs in Epic's Unreal Engine. I'm joined by Lauren Ridge, an Epic programmer, who will be backstage driving our demo. Uh, we, working together, we can work in real time <laughs> uh, to create an immersive experience as we step inside the Star Wars universe. Now, Lauren's backstage so we can show you the environment around her. And now, we're going to show you from my perspective. Here we are on the planet Mustafar. Thanks to the native VR support in macOS High Sierra, I can use Unreal Engine's editor to create content inside the VR experience. And for the first time, it's all powered by my Mac. On my left motion controller, I have my radial menu, which acts as my artist palette. And on the right, I have the laser I use to interact with the world. I have some fire here, so let's try that out. Huh. All right, very nice. Uh, let's do some set dressing. What do you have? Let's see, let me open my content browser. It has all the assets I need to dress my scene. I think I saw a good landing spot for an Imperial shuttle over here, so let's bring one of those in. We've actually set up these smart assets so they know exactly where to come in for their landing. Great, all right, uh, can we go wide? Sure, I can grab onto a little two hands and scale myself up. I can also use this to rotate the world around me. Oh, very cool. I have a TIE Fighter here too, so let's bring one of those in. Thanks to more than five and a half teraflops of GPU performance, manipulating objects is super smooth and really intuitive. 
Great. All right. Can we have a squadron of those flying overhead? Okay. What about from over there on the horizon? To over there by the castle. Great. Perfect. Okay. All right. Let me teleport back down. Oh, hey, seeing the castle back there reminds me we're missing one important element. Right. How could I forget? All right. Nice. Boy, it looks really good silhouetted against the sky back there. Can we go in closer? Sure thing. It's really cool how Metal 2 unlocks Unreal's advanced rendering feature set on the map. Wow, yeah, really nice. All right, uh, let's play this scene from here. Okay. Oh, he's upset. That's the third one this week. Whoa. <laughs> I'm glad he didn't see me there. Mm. Wouldn't be so sure about that. All right, actually, let's stop it right there. That was a close one. <laughs> uh. well, it's, it's really nice to see an iMac rendering this level of graphics in VR mode at a smooth 90 frames a second. Really great. All right, thank you, Lauren. Metal 2 and Unreal's, uh, our Epic's Unreal Engine will enable the next generation of storytellers. We use this technology in our filmmaking every day for virtual set scouting, for art direction, and shot design. And that means that this immersive content can be made by the same people that bring you the films. That's incredibly powerful. At Lucasfilm and ILMX Lab, we're looking forward to using our Macs to create new experiences as we invite people everywhere to step inside our stories. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, John and Lauren. That was awesome. So that is our update to the iMac line. And to recap, they have the best Mac displays we've ever made. Faster processors, higher memory capacity, super fast storage, Thunderbolt 3, and as you saw, incredible graphics performance. <laughs> so here's the line, and, but there's one more change because we're gonna bring even more value to the iMac product line. For the first time ever, we're gonna have a 4K iMac that starts at just $12.99. But the updates don't stop with just the iMac because we're refreshing our notebooks today as well. And together, the MacBook and MacBook Pro make up the strongest line of notebooks we've ever had. But we're gonna make them even better because we're moving to Kaby Lake here as well. And we're bringing faster SSDs to our MacBook and faster standard graphics to the 15-inch MacBook Pro. So a great performance bump across the board. So here's that lineup, but just like the iMac, we're gonna bring more value here as well because we're gonna have a new configuration of the 13-inch MacBook Pro that also starts at just $12.99. So there you have it. We've updated seven of our most popular Macs, and the MacBook Air is going to get a bump in, mega, in megahertz as well. And even better, they're all shipping today. Now, we care deeply about the environment, and so as with all our products, we've been working really hard to ensure that these new Macs are free of harmful chemicals, very energy efficient, and highly recyclable. So that's everything we're updating today. But it's not actually everything we want to show you today. Now, the iMac line has incredible breadth. It spans from an entry-level system that's perfect for use at home or in a school, all the way up through that powerhouse 27-inch model, which allows professional customers to create amazing things every day. But that said, there's another class of pro users who would love to be able to take advantage of the iMac's display and design but they need workstation class performance that can't possibly fit into an all-in-one. 
Well, we wanted to challenge that assumption, and so we've been working really hard to see just how far we can push the iMac. Now, this isn't going to be shipping until the end of the year, but I'm really excited to be able to give you a sneak peek at what we've been up to. And here it is. So that is the new iMac Pro. Now the first thing you'll notice, it features the same great design as our 27-inch iMac, but it's in this seriously badass space gray finish. <laughs> and with that stunning new color and gorgeous 5K display, this is without a doubt the most beautiful iMac we've ever made. But it's also going to be, by far, the most powerful iMac we've ever made. In fact, this will be the most powerful Mac we've ever made. because. Because we actually are going to put workstation class performance into our incredible 5K iMac design. Now to do that, the team had to completely rethink the thermal architecture. And they came up with this really efficient dual centrifugal fan solution, which generates significantly more airflow than a traditional iMac. In fact, the iMac Pro has a greater than 80% increase in cooling capacity. So that means we can deliver unbelievable performance while still maintaining the quiet operation you'd expect from an iMac. So let's talk about what's inside, and I want to start with the CPU, because we wanted to go really big here. So the iMac Pro is going to ship with an 8-core Xeon processor. But it's also going to ship with a 10-core Xeon processor. And then we thought, you know, we've gone this far. Let's get really nutty. So we're going to offer it with up to 18 cores. That is a ton of compute power. But we didn't want to stop there, because we wanted to go really big on graphics as well. So the iMac Pro is going to use AMD's Radeon Vega graphics. This is their brand new workstation class graphics architecture. It features a completely new GPU core and high bandwidth on package memory. It's going to be available with up to 16 gigabytes of VRAM and over 400 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And we aren't going to use an entry level configuration here because our implementation is going to offer up to 11 teraflops of single precision compute power. That's three times more than the best GPU in a Mac Pro. But it actually gets even better, because this Radeon Vega GPU can also do half precision compute. So that means the iMac Pro can deliver up to 22 teraflops of half precision computation. This is a really big deal for things like machine learning development. So the iMac Pro, as you can see, is going to be a monster when it comes to graphics, but we didn't want to stop there either. So we're going to let you configure it with up to 128 gigabytes of ECC memory. That's twice what you can do in a standard 27-inch iMac. <laughs> and up to 4 terabytes of 3 gigabyte per second SSD. Now, the iMac Pro is also going to have a full complement of high-performance I.O., including four Thunderbolt 3 ports, and for the first time ever in any Mac, built-in 10 gigabit Ethernet. And with all that cutting-edge I.O., you can do some pretty amazing things. Like, you can hook up two 5K displays and two high-performance RAID arrays. No iMac before could ever do that. And when you combine that with the internal display, that means the iMac Pro can drive up to 44 million pixels. There's so much more we don't even have time to get into. Things like a 1080p FaceTime camera, a user configurable visa mount option, uh, two times wider AVX instructions, and even a UHS-2 SD card slot. So with all these high performance technologies and our incredible 5K display, this iMac Pro is going to be an awesome workstation for things like real-time 3D rendering, high frame rate immersive VR, machine learning development, and with all those cores and all that memory, super fast code compiling. Now, speaking of workstations, we wanted to compare the starting configuration of the iMac Pro to what's on the market. And so if you were to go out and build a comparably spec system today, it would cost over $7,000. And keep in mind, that's a system that doesn't have our best-in-class 5K display, doesn't have the iMac Pro's incredible all-in-one design, 
And it obviously doesn't run Mac OS. Well, this is the starting configuration of the iMac Pro, and we're going to price it at just $49.99. And it's going to be available in December. So that's a sneak peek at the iMac Pro. It packs workstation class performance into our incredible 27-inch iMac design with its gorgeous 5K display. And it is going to be the most powerful Mac we have ever made. So that is all of our Mac news today. Now back to Tim. Thanks, John. All right. So many th great things happening with uh, the Mac. And John, I agree, that iMac Pro is really badass. <laughs> All right, next up, let's talk about iOS. <laughs> the world's best and most advanced mobile operating system. Our customers love the latest version, iOS 10, which has an industry-leading 96% customer satisfaction. And it's absolutely incredible that 86% of our customers are running iOS 10 and taking advantages of its capabilities. This blows away the other platforms that suffer from horrible fragmentation. With, with iOS, developers can always target the latest capabilities and features of our latest operating system and be confident that there's customers there for them. Now today, we're going to take the world's best and most advanced mobile operating system and turn it up to 11. <laughs> and I'd like to invite Craig back to take you through it. Craig. Thank you, Tim. Hello again. Let's talk about iOS 11. It's a big one. Now, we have a big focus on technologies in iOS 11, but also some really big features. We have a lot to talk about. We're going to start with messages. Now, you all know in iOS 10, we added iMessage apps and stickers. People have had a lot of fun with these. And now in iOS 11, we're making them more discoverable than ever with this redesigned app drawer. You can see you have your apps accessible right there at the bottom of the screen with just a tap. You can bring them up, scroll through them, and tap into any app. It's really easy. It's going to make it a lot of fun for you to use your apps and stickers. Now, the big story with messages, though, is messages in iCloud. Because now, with your iMessages in iCloud, when you sign in to another new device, well, all of your conversations are automatically synchronized. And in fact, they stay in sync. So if you want to delete an embarrassing message that you don't want in your transcript, well, it goes away everywhere, which is kind of nice. So this, of course, is, allows us to optimize your device storage, because with your messages in the cloud, we only need to keep your most recent messages cached on the device. And so that makes for smaller and faster backups, now, this is available for iOS and the Mac. And of course, your messages remain end-to-end -end encrypted. Next, Apple Pay. So we love using Apple Pay to buy things at retail. In fact, Apple Pay is the number one contactless, contactless payment <laughs> service on mobile devices. And by the end of the year, it'll be available in more than 50% of retailers here in the US. Yeah. But in addition to paying at retail, we use Apple Pay in apps. We use it in the web. And there was one final frontier we wanted to conquer, and that's Apple Pay for person-to-person -person payments. <laughs> now, it's super simple because it's integrated right in to Messages as an iMessage app. So you can send and receive money right in your transcript. And of course, when you send it, you authenticate securely with Touch ID. And if you receive money uh, with iMessage, it goes into your Apple Pay cash card. And from there, well, you can send it on to friends and family if you're charitable. 
You can make Apple Pay purchases at retail or on the web. And of course, you can pull it out and transfer it to your bank. And it's available across all these iOS devices and Apple Watch too. Thank you. So next, let's turn to Siri. Now, Siri is used monthly for more than 375 million devices. It's absolutely huge. And it's available in more languages and more countries than any other assistant, 21 languages in 36 countries. So for iOS 11, we're making a big upgrade to your primary interface in dealing with Siri, and that's Siri's voice. We've used deep learning now to create a really natural and expressive voice for Siri, and I'd like you to hear it. Here's the forecast for the next 10 days. Sunny, sunny, and sunny. Three different ways to say sunny. Very powerful. Now, Siri also has a male voice, and it sounds fantastic, too. I love machine learning, especially since I'm a machine learning. So Siri has a great new visual interface as well. And it's able to provide you with follow-up questions and answers with just a tap and multiple results. When you make a query, it's really handy. Now, Siri also has a new capability, just translation. So you can now ask something like, how do you say, what are the most popular dishes in your restaurant in Chinese? And Siri can say, Totally. Now, translation initially will support translation from English to Chinese, French, German, Italian, and Spanish, and we'll have more language combinations coming in the months to come. Now, when it comes to using Siri to access your other applications, we have SiriKit, and SiriKit can now do more than ever in iOS 11. So now, you can do task management by using Siri to make tasks in OmniFocus or Things, take notes in Evernote, do banking in City Mobile, or even bring up a QR code in WeChat. Now, Siri isn't just a voice assistant, because with Siri intelligence, Siri not only understands your voice, it understands the context, it understands your interests, it understands how you use your device, and this allows it to ultimately understand what you want next. Now, we've all experienced this where Siri can help us predict what apps we might want to use next, give us a time to leave notification based on our calendar and where we are, help us respond to a text message. In iOS 11, Siri uses on-device learning to understand more about topics of interest to us. So it can actually suggest topics we might be interested in learning about in news. It can help us respond with our location for getting to an appointment to someone in messages, and even help us make a calendar appointment based on something we've just booked inside of Safari on the web. And what Siri learns about you on device is now kept synced across all of your devices. So you're dealing with one Siri, but of course, this is kept completely private, readable only by you and your devices. <laughs> Next, let's talk about the camera. People love the fantastic cameras in the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus. And in fact, our customers now take a trillion photos per year. It's absolutely amazing. And they take a lot of video too. And today, they do it in H.264. But now, with our latest iPhones and iOS 7, they get, we're using HEVC, which is giving us up to two times better compression for camera captured videos, which means less storage space used on your device and less space used in the cloud. And we're applying these same techniques to replace JPEG capture with what we call HEIF, high efficiency image format. It's based on HEVC and it also provides awesome quality images at half the size on your device. And of course, you can still share completely compatibly with others. Now, with the iPhone 7 Plus, we love taking these beautiful portrait photos. And now, with iOS 11, we can take low light photographs using optical image stabilization, true tone flash, HDR, delivers incredible image quality. And we're taking the depth information that we can capture with two cameras and exposing it to developers 
with a new depth API, which has allowed them to do incredibly fun and artistic photos, like this, uh, using, using the depth API. Now, when you're done taking your photos, you go to enjoy them in the Photos app. And one of the ways I love enjoying them is with me the Memories uh, feature, because Memories is able to scan my library and find all kinds of fun events, and now it can do more than ever. It uses uh, machine learning to identify things like sporting events, even weddings, anniversaries, memories of, of your babies. It's really great. And when you go to play those back, you can see them not just in normal landscape orientation, but now watch them in portrait, taking full advantage of the height of your display. Now, when it comes to live photos, we have some great enhancements as well. So you can now trim your live photos, the video around the still. You can mark any part of the video as your key photo and so much more. So these are some of the big features in iOS 11. There's one other, which is a major redesign to Control Center. Rather than show it in slides, how about we do a demo? All right, let's take our first live look. No, I don't want to do that. Let's take our first live look at iOS 11. Now I'm going to just bring up Control Center, as always. And what you'll notice is Control Center is now a single page packs all the features into a single page. Now, of course, it has simple switches. I'll just do an orientation lock. It's got a beautiful little animation there for the orientation lock. It has sliders available, so you can adjust volume like this. But it provides greater depth, because with 3D touch, 3D touch in on a slider like this and get access to more controls. And this allows us to pack lots of capabilities really easily into the design. So you see, we have our wireless controls. Well, I could just tap on airplane mode, but if I 3D touch on the platter, I get access to even more features. And this is really great with your music because you can operate them here or jump in for even more information. So it's a really great new control center, and I think you're really going to love it. Now, we've also taken this opportunity to redesign lock screen and notification center by making them one. So now, when I'm on my lock screen, if I unlock the device, just like that. Uh, I can actually now swipe back down. I'm actually on my lock screen seeing those notifications, but I can get at all my other notifications just by scrolling up like that. It's a really great unification, and you still have access, of course, to your widgets on the left and your camera on the right. Now, let's take a look at photos, these beautiful portrait photos but also these great live photos. And you know, live photos capture a still, but then also a bunch of video automatically captured around it, and sometimes the best shot wasn't the still. Well now, we can go into edit mode, we could trim this video if we want, but we also can capture just the frame we want and make that our key photo. Now, we can do other really fun things with live photos. Now here's one, Great shot, this girl blowing a bubble. But wouldn't it be greater, great if she could just keep blowing that bubble? Well, now she can. We actually use computer vision to compute a seamless loop around this live photo. It's really fun. And we have another great effect. So here's a fun jump in the pool. But wouldn't it be better if it bounced? There it is. Now, we can really do some artistic things with live photos as well. So you see, this is a, sh a shot where we have still landscape, but then this movement in the water. Now, if you wanted to capture this kind of motion, traditionally, you'd have to get a tripod and figure out how to configure a long exposure on your high-end camera. But now, you can actually just go into the effects here and select long exposure and check it out. It's really gorgeous. Now, let's take a quick look at memories, because you see memories can now capture things like activities, like scuba diving, can spot your anniversaries, these really touching uh, memories of your children growing up, and most importantly, your pets. Let's play a movie about you know, th these pets. And what we'll see is that we play them, of course, traditionally here in landscape, which is a great way to watch video. And of course, 
Memories is using computer vision to actually identify photos of your pet and pick the best scenes. Now what's great is I can also rotate my phone now into portrait and it automatically reformats to take full advantage of the height of the display. And that's a quick look at Memories. Now, with Memories, we're using machine learning to help learn more about you and what you're interested in by looking at your photo library. But now in iOS 11, Siri does so much more in learning how you're using your device. So for instance, if I'm in Safari here and I'm reading about uh, Iceland, maybe I'm considering taking a, a trip there. There's uh, Reykjavik as a uh, nice location. Well now Siri actually on my device spots my interest. So when I go, let's say, into news, Siri automatically surfaces for me a recommendation that I might be interested in news about Iceland. I can just tap in and heart this one like this. And if I tap into a particular article, we can see it mentions certain locations in Iceland. I think this one is called Snæfellsnes. I hope it's okay with anyone who speak, speaks Icelandic. Um, but what's great is now Siri is learning this vocabulary. He knows it might be something I'm going to use in my communication in the future. So when I go into messages and start typing a message, and let's say I start typing Reykjavik, well, check it out. It learns that Reykjavik is probably a word I might type. And what about, there it is, Snæfellsnes. Pretty awesome. Now, let's take a look at stickers, because you notice now, right on the bottom of the display, we have access to all my sticker packs. I can tap in on the bottom here to my Star Wars sticker pack. I can tap and slide, say select music, and we now have Apple Pay right here as a Messages app. But what's so cool is if I receive a message saying that I owe someone money, well, you notice the quick type keyboard automatically surfaces Apple Pay as an option and picks the amount out as what I might want to pay. I can just tap the pay button, send, and authenticate with my fingerprint, and just like that, I've paid with Apple Pay. And that is a quick demo of iOS 11. But wait, there is more. It starts with Maps. Now in iOS 10, Maps brought beautiful new clarity to navigation, and we're now giving you an enhanced information for when you get there to the mall. So we have detailed floor plans now of malls with place cards, directory, and search, and we let you browse by floor. Now we're gonna be supporting malls in all of these cities out the gate and hundreds more per month thereafter. And we're also bringing the support to air, major airports. You can see where security is so you can plan. Now, we'll be supporting all of these airports to start and again, building out more over time. And of course, we have more improvements to navigation. So now in the upper left, you can even see your speed limit. I hope you're paying attention to that. And lane guidance, so you know which lane to be in to make your next move when navigating. Now, we know in addition to navigation, people like to do more with their phones sometimes while driving. And our safest solution for doing this is CarPlay, lets you keep your eyes on the road while you're doing things like asking Siri to play music. Well, we wanted to bring this same level of safety to everyone who maybe doesn't have one of the 200 models of car that currently support CarPlay. And we're building on the Do Not Disturb with a new feature we call Do Not Disturb While Driving. And it's all about keeping your eyes on the road. When you're driving, you don't need to be responding to these kinds of messages. In fact, you don't need to see them. So now, when you install iOS 11, we're going to use Bluetooth to understand if you're connected to a car, or even if you don't have Bluetooth, we're going to use Wi-Fi Doppler effect to measure that you're moving in a car. And when you finish that first drive, we're going to suggest, hey, how about we activate Do Not Disturb While Driving? And when we do, instead of seeing all those notifications, we have this new user interface for you. Now, if you're tempted and you try to turn on your phone, you're actually going to receive this. A little reminder that you're not receiving notifications while you're driving. But of course, you might be sitting in the back seat 
in which case you can tell us I'm not driving, you can get through. But what if you are driving and someone sends you a message? Well, they can now get an automatic response saying, I'll see your message when I get where I'm going. And you can also enable select people to break through if it's especially urgent. You can have the peace of mind that you can get contacted, and they can reply urgent, and that message will go through. We think this is going to be a real important step in safety in the car. <laughs> Next up, HomeKit. So HomeKit provides a secure and private way to automate all of your devices, uh, your home accessories. And you can do it right inside the Home app and control them here. And also, of course, use your voice with Siri. Now, almost all the major accessory makers are providing great HomeKit accessories across all of these categories, from security cameras and door locks to lights and fans. But there's one category really close to our heart that we wanted to add to HomeKit, and that's speakers. So You'll now be able to configure your speakers inside of HomeKit and access them via our new AirPlay 2 protocol. It builds multi-room audio in throughout iOS. So you can play music to select speakers throughout your home, right from the music app. And with Apple Music, we have a new feature called Share It Up Next. So if you have a friend over and you have a playlist going, and maybe your friend wants to contribute to that playlist, well, they can do that without interrupting the music. You all can pile into that party playlist. Now, the, all these speaker makers have announced upcoming support for AirPlay 2, but of course, many of us already own a great AirPlay 2 compatible speaker, and those are the ones connected to our Apple TV, because now your Apple TV can be played to from your uh, iPhone or iOS device and Mac anywhere in the home, and of course, if you turn on your Apple TV, it can control playback home-wide, including using Siri. And we're providing a great developer API so third-party audio apps in iOS can all get in on the multi-room audio fun. Next is Apple Music. Now, last fall, we, we introduced an all-new design for Apple Music, which brought greater clarity and simplicity to the Apple Music experience. We now have 27 million customers who are really enjoying the curation as well as the personalization of Apple Music. But of course, a lot of the way we discover music is to ask one of our friends, what have you been listening to lately? So now in Apple Music, you'll be able to find out right inside the application. For all the music served up, for, and for you, you'll see indicators if this is music your friends are listening to, and they can configure their profile, uh, either pu to be public or private, and control what playlists they share, or whether all the music they share they want to make available to their other friends. Now, for developers, we're also providing a new API, Music Kit, for Apple Music. This allows apps full access to the Apple Music service, both on device and from your cloud service. And you can do a tremendous amount with this. Now, Nike has done great exercise playlists using the full Apple Music catalog. With Anchor, anyone can be a DJ using all 40 million songs. And Shazam can automatically add songs to your collection that it identifies. But you know, one of the biggest stories today for iOS 11 is about the App Store. Now, to give you the big news with the App Store, I'd like to hand it off to Phil Schiller. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's hear it from the way back of the room. Come on, good morning, everyone. Yes. I am so excited to be able to talk to you this morning about the App Store. The App Store is turning nine years old, and it is going so well. There are 500 million weekly visitors to the App Store who come to see your amazing apps and to download them. They have now downloaded over 180 billion apps to date. That's incredible. That, that does not include auto re-downloads and updates. Amazing. And just recently, we passed $70 billion paid out to developers to date. 30% yes. of that in the last year alone. The apps are incredible, and customers are doing things with them that none of us had ever imagined. 
like this. These are people in Hong Kong playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> Pokemon Go is from Niantic. It was one of the big hits from last year. And there have been a lot of big hits last year from big developers and indie developers alike. And together, the developers at Apple, we've made this the best app platform in the world. So thank you. Yes. Thank you for the incredible apps you make that we and our customers all love. It's not by chance that the App Store has become such a great place. From the beginning, we've had two very important goals. To make the App Store a trusted and safe place for users, and to make it a great opportunity for all developers. We continue to work really hard at that. Over the last year, the team's done a lot of great things to make the App Store an even better store for all of us. There's many things we can talk about, but I think one stands head and shoulders above the rest. Faster app review times. Yeah. I'm sure you're well aware that the majority of apps are all now reviewed in under 24 hours, many in just one to two hours. The team is going to keep working hard at that. And we have a lot more coming for the remainder of the year. I've highlighted a bunch of things here. I'll just point out one of them. You can read some of your favorite things out there. Uh, a big request from developers is called phased releases. That when you sub yeah, <laughs> woo for phased releases, come on. Phased releases means <laughs> when you submit an app, you can choose if you want it to be phased over time so it doesn't hit your infrastructure all at once, and you can see how customers are responding to that update. So it's a really great feature for you to take advantage of. And there are a lot of things coming this year, but there is, there is one that is incredibly gigantic. And that is we're going to do something that we've never done before in the nine years of the App Store. We're going to completely redesign it. A brand new App Store. It is absolutely beautiful. The App Store starts with a brand new tab called Today. Now, do you remember back the first time you started downloading apps? when you used the App Store, and it was so much fun to go in every single day and discover the new apps that were appearing. I mean, that's an amazing feeling. And we're bringing that back again with this brand new tab called Today, a whole new way to discover apps. It's a place where we can feature the apps we all love and the stories about the developers who created them. It's going to be such a great place for customers to discover your apps every single day. There's another new tab, Games. Games, the biggest area of the App Store has its own dedicated space now. So for all of us who loves gaming and finding the best featured games of the day and seeing charts about gaming, this is now a place to go to experience all that's happening with games. And not only can we feature games, but for the first time in the App Store, we can feature in-app purchases as well. A big part of your business is now there in the App Store. So the next time you have a brand new level, you have a brand new character, Customers can see them right in the App Store and click on them and start the process to get them right away. And since games have their own tab, now apps have their own tab. This is everything that we love about apps besides games with dedicated features and charts all there for customers to enjoy. And every app and every game, of course, has its own product page in the store. These are more beautiful than ever, more engaging with incredible videos. You're going to love all the features on your product pages. And there's sessions here at WWDC to learn how to take advantage of all those great new app page features. But these are just some of the new things in the all new app store. The new Today tab, new Games tab, new Apps tab. And would love to show it to you live for the very first time. So please welcome Anti Product Marketing Manager for the App Store to the stage. And Thanks, Phil. I'm so excited to show you the new App Store. So let's get to it. I'm going to open the store, and I land right here on the Today tab, the new front of the App Store that updates every day. The first thing I see is our top story. The world premiere of Monument Valley 2 is finally here. Let's check it out by tapping on the card. This opens a story view where we can learn more about the game and what makes it so great. Looks like this is going to be even more beautiful than the first. I can watch videos that show me what the gameplay is like. And here's a cool quote from Dan Gray at Us Two Games about what inspired them. I can share the story with a friend, 
And what's incredible is that we can actually all download this today only on the App Store. Let's see what else is happening today. What have we got here? Oh, here's a how-to guide about Visco. I use this app all the time. Let's check it out. This is packed full of useful tips. So even if you have an app already, you still might learn something new. Like, I didn't know you could use it to make animated GIFs or GIFs. Anyway, you can make them. I just scroll back up and pull down on the card, and I'm back in the feed. Every day, there's a new app of the day, and a new game of the day, and the daily list. These are great because they're focused on a theme or a goal, like meditation. I've actually been trying some of these out to get ready for this, and it's totally working. If I'm busy and miss a day, I can scroll down and see stories from earlier in the week. So that's the Today tab. If I only want to see games, now I can go to the New Games tab. This is huge. Let's check it out. Up at the top, I can see the biggest new releases or just what the game editors are playing this week. If I scroll down, I can watch a whole bunch of game videos. And it's not just previews, but also tips and gameplay videos by editors, too. If I scroll down, I can see charts that only feature games, so it's really easy to see what the most popular games are separate from apps. And now I can browse by game categories, too. This page is just packed full of recommendations. This artsy game looks fun. Let's check it out. I'm going to tap on the icon, and it opens up a redesigned app page. It's more beautiful and more useful. I can watch more videos that show me how fun this is. And this badge at the top tells me it was named Editor's Choice. If I scroll down, I can see ratings and reviews front and center. So I can see what other customers think before making a choice. Like this review. It tells me this game is great for killing time. Thanks, Furious Potato Face. For all the incredible apps on the store, there's a new tab too, the Apps tab. Let's go there. It shares the same great design as the Games tab, but with a focus just on apps. So that was just the first day on the new App Store. Now you can see why we're so excited to have a beautiful new place to share apps and games we love with you. Back to you, Phil. Thank you, Anne. So that's your first glimpse of an entirely new app store. We hope you love it. We hope customers love it. They visit it every single day to download your incredible apps. And that's it for the app store. Back to you, Craig. Thank you, Phil. The app store looks just fantastic. So those are some of the big features in iOS 11. But of course, it's also core technologies. Now, Metal 2 and HEVC coming to iOS as well, but there's more, and it starts with machine learning. Now, you've seen the way we've used machine learning throughout the experiences on Apple Watch, for instance, and the predictive Siri watch face. We use it on the iPad for palm rejection when you're writing with Apple Pencil. Of course, we use it to uh, extend your battery life by predicting how you're going to use your device. And you've seen it throughout photos with memories and face recognition. Well, now for all of you developers, we want to make powerful machine learning easy for you to incorporate in your apps. And we're doing it via a set of new APIs. It starts with the Vision API, which provides face tracking, face detection, landmarks, all of these core features we use inside of our apps. And a natural language API that provides capabilities like tokenization and named entity recognition. Now, these are all built on Core ML. And Core ML provides high performance implementations of deep neural networks, recurrent neural networks, convolutional neural networks, support vector machines. And they allow you to take models that you've built with any of these popular third party tools and using our machine learning model converter, execute them with tremendous performance on device. It gives you all the data privacy benefits and all of the carefully tuned compatibility with all of our platforms. And the performance 
really is incredible. You look at this benchmark, it's called Inception V3. It's a popular photo recognition benchmark. iPhone is six times faster than Google Pixel and the Samsung S8 using Core ML. Next, I'd like to turn to AR. Now, with multi-touch, we've really changed the way that you interact with the world on the screen of your iPhone. And with the camera, we've allowed you to capture the world around you. But when you bring these things together, the results can actually be quite profound. Now, it's called augmented reality, and we have a new core technology called AR Kit to bring it to all of you and I'd like to show it to you in a demo now. So we've all seen a lot of carefully edited vision videos on this topic recently, but in this case, I'd like to show you something for real. So what we see here is an iPhone that's look, using its camera, but using vi computer vision, it's actually able to identify surfaces such as this table, and I can actually just add an object. This is a developer application, a test application that you'll all be getting code for that allows you to do these things. Now, this is just a virtual object on this table. Now, got some, some steam in there coming off the cup. Now, I can add other objects to the scene, and these things can actually interact. Let's add a lamp. And I want you to watch when I turn the lamp up on the dynamic shadows here. I'm going to move the cup and watch how the shadow moves in relationship to the light here. It's really pretty incredible. Now, I can add additional objects. Let's add a vase to this, uh, to this scene. I mean, isn't that just incredible? You guys are actually in the shot here with these objects all in augmented reality. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of the technology involved. It's really pretty incredible. Now, how do we do it? Well, AR Kit provides fast and stable motion tracking, and it uses all of the sensors and the camera on your device to do this. It actually finds planes like floors and tables. It's able to estimate ambient light, which helps us with the rendering, and also helps with scale. You notice that cup hit the table looking the size of a cup, not the size of an elephant. And we provide integration into all kinds of third-party frameworks to help you with your rendering. Now, the implementation is possible because we're able to take advantage of the awesome hardware and iOS devices, the cameras, the high-performance CPU and GPU, and the motion sensors. And when you bring the software together with these devices, we actually have hundreds and of millions of iPhones and iPads that are going to be capable of AR. And in fact, that's going to make overnight AR kit the largest AR platform in the world. We've had some third parties in to take a look at AR Kit, and they are totally excited, and we are just blown away by what they've been able to accomplish. IKEA, of course, is placing furniture everywhere, and it's really super awesome. <laughs> but check this out what you can do with Batman Lego. I mean, how fun is this? Right on the table, a Lego with a live Lego, Batman, and you can explode the uh, Lego like, like uh, you could never do in the real world, pan around it, and interact with Batman right there. It's really awesome. And then Pokemon Go, well, we've all seen it before, but check it out with AR Kid. The Pokemon is so real. He's right there on the ground. As the ball bounces, it actually bounces right there in the real environment. It's AR like you've never seen it before. Now, there's, there's one of these uh, that I think you just really need to see, see live. Now, Wingnut AR is director Peter Jackson's new production company. It's dedicated to producing AR content. Uh, we all know Peter Jackson from his incredible cinematic work on movies like the Lord of the Rings series. but. He's now really excited about AR. And to show you what he has in the works, I'm thrilled to introduce Wingnut AR's creative director, Alistair Cool. Alistair. Thanks, Ray. We're really excited to share an exclusive sneak peek at something we've been working on. With AR Kit, you don't need any special equipment or tracking markers, it just works. Dan's here with me from Wingnut AR, so let's take a look.
Here we're using ARKit to detect the plane on the table, estimate its size, and lock our content onto the surface. And since this is augmented reality, you folks are all in the shot too. This is all rendered in real time using the power of Unreal Engine 4. We're at a remote outpost on a desolate world where supplies are scarce. Airships come here to refuel, get repairs, and to trade. These are our townsfolk. They're expecting some visitors soon, so they're all starting to get ready for their arrival. Except for this guy down here, apparently. Who hired him? That's how airships arriving now. And what's really cool here is that with the arc it's tracking, you can get in really close and choose how to view the action. It's like you're the director of your own experience. Oh, looks like some raiders are attacking. I guess that takes care of that guy. Oh. Wouldn't it be cool to have airship battles like this in your own living room? Oh, I think they're gonna regret attacking this outpost. And another one down. And we got him. Well, that didn't end well for anyone. But our heroes are limping away to fight another day. So that's one of the things we've been up to at Wingnut AR. And the fact that AR Kit. Thank you. Thank you. The fact that AR Kit enables hundreds of millions of people to enjoy experiences like this opens up so many possibilities. I think it's a real game changer. Look out for an AR experience from us in the App Store later this year. Thank you. Thank you. So what do you think? So those are some of the major features in iOS 11. Of course, there's much more than we have time to talk about today, but I want to highlight some features of special interest to our customers in China, like QR support code support integrated right into the main camera, accessible from the lock screen, super useful, yes, super useful for customers in China. So that's our update for iOS 11. I'm going to turn it back to Tim. Thank you. That's right. iOS 11 is absolutely jam-packed with great features, and I can't wait for you to get your hands on the new App Store and AR kit. Number five, an important part of the iOS story is, of course, iPad. <laughs> iPad has completely changed the way we work, play, teach, learn, and create. It's truly a magical piece of glass that transforms into anything you want. We've been pushing the boundaries on iPad. And today, we're going to push them further than ever before. And to tell you all about it, I'd like to invite up Jaws. Jaws? Thank you, Tim. And good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to talk to you today about iPad Pro. When we first introduced iPad Pro just 18 months ago, it completely redefined what you could do with your iPad. Along with your incredible apps, it allowed our users to do really amazing things. From professional design and illustration, to fashion, to architecture, to engineering, and so much more. We're really excited about what can be real in your world today with iPad Pro. Well, and as you know, there's two models to iPad Pro today. There's a 13-inch and a 9.7-inch. And the 9.7-inch is our most popular model. It has a screen large enough to get your work done, but it's in a thin and light enough package that allows you to take it with you everywhere you go. Well, today, we're going to introduce an all-new iPad Pro. It's going to take everything you love about the 9.7-inch and give you a whole lot more to love. 
Let's take a look. This is a new iPad Pro. It's the first iPad Pro with a larger 10 and a half inch retina display. Now why 10 and a half inch? Well, for one, it's a lot larger. It's 20% larger than a 9.7 inch. But we are able to reduce the borders by nearly 40%, which allows us to fit it in this incredibly compact design that still weighs just one pound. And of course, 10.5 inch also allows us to do some other things. It's the perfect size to allow us to display a full-size on-screen keyboard. Woo! It's also the perfect size to allow us to have a full-size smart keyboard as well. And when we deliver the smart keyboard, we're going to have support for more than 30 languages at launch, including Chinese, and for the very first time, a Japanese JIS keyboard. Now, iPad Pro has always had the best displays in the industry, and both sizes are going to get really incredible new displays today. They're the best displays that we've ever made. They're packed with incredible features like True Tone for automatic white balance, P3 wide color gamut for the best color, ultra low reflectivity, the best in the industry, and they're 50% brighter with 600 nits. And this extra brightness and the P3 wide color gamut means that with iOS 11, you'll be able to display HDR video for the first time on an iPad for a really immersive cinematic experience. They're truly awesome displays. But our biggest breakthrough is a feature we call ProMotion. So what is ProMotion? Well, we were able to take our unique hardware and software capabilities and dramatically improve our display performance. Now, typically, up until today, mobile displays have refreshed at 60 hertz, means they update their content 60 times every second. Well, on the new iPad Pro, we've doubled that maximum refresh rate to an incredible 120 hertz. So what does that mean to you? It means that all of your motion content on your screen is going to be smoother, crisper, more responsive. Now, this is something you have to really touch and feel yourself to appreciate because our projection systems just aren't capable of doing those type of refresh rates. But I'll tell you, the difference is dramatic. And when you scroll, it's buttery smooth. Now, the higher refresh rate also means that it works even better with the Apple Pencil. We already have the industry-leading performance for drawing and writing with the Apple Pencil, but with ProMotion, it gets even better. It's more responsive, and it reduces our latency to an industry-best 20 milliseconds. So drawing is incredibly fluid and even more natural. You're going to love using the Apple Pencil with the new iPad Pro. Another breakthrough of ProMotion is that these become the first mobile displays to be able to dynamically adjust the refresh rate, depending on what you're looking at. This is a really big breakthrough for both display quality as well as for power savings. So when you have fast moving content, they can update quickly but they can also update slower when you don't need that type of refresh rate. For example, a still image. This allows us to save a lot of energy and give you better battery life. So hopefully you see why these are not just the best displays that we've ever made, but we think they're the most advanced displays in the planet. Next, let's talk about performance. iPad is already best in class for performance, but we're not resting on our laurels. These are the fastest we've ever created. Inside them, they're powered by the A10X Fusion chip. The A10X has a six-core CPU, three high-performance cores, three high-efficiency cores, all automatically managed by the Apple Performance Controller. It also has a 12-core GPU. This is a powerhouse. And it delivers 30% faster CPU performance over our already industry-leading A9X and 40% faster graphics performance. Our chip team has done just an amazing job over the years with the performance improvements, and the results have been staggering. They're delivering an industry-leading graphics performance that's more than 500 times the original iPad from just a few years ago. But of course, numbers only tell part of the story. To demonstrate the real-world performance of the A10X and the new iPad Pro, I'd like to invite Ash Hewson of Serif to give you a demo of their new Pro Photo Editing app 
called Affinity Photo. Ash? Thanks, Jules. So I'm thrilled today to be able to show you the iPad version of Affinity Photo. This is a truly high-end professional photo editing tool. And on this latest iPad Pro, we can achieve levels of performance which are simply unattainable on any other device. And I'm going to try and show you that today by creating a movie poster. I've already set up a few layers. I've kind of got this great background, some stormy sky. I've got a turbulent sea and this ship. Now, the first thing you'll notice when you're using this is that as you're kind of moving layers around, rotating them, or even just sort of panning and zooming around your work, I'm seeing all of this now at 120 frames a second. So it just feels incredibly smooth. But when you come to edit layers, because of metal, we can achieve performance more than four times an i7 quad-core desktop PC. And I'll show you what that means. On this C, I'm going to apply a 12 filter. And look, just with my finger, I can kind of push this C around. I can even just like flick a wave right over the side of the ship. It's a totally new way to kind of interact with your designs. And actually, everything's this fast. So let's say I wanted to set this ship on fire, for example. I've got this fireball here. I can move this over the back of the ship. But to make that look more realistic, I need to apply blend mode. Now, normally, blend modes are something that takes a lot of trial and error. But now, look at this. I can just scrub down here, and I get an instant preview of all of the different blend modes. So it makes it really, really easy to select the right blend mode that I want. Now, of course, everything I've done so far, I've done using touch. But with iPad Pro, we have the best stylus that's ever been made. And we can do some great stuff with Apple Pencil, too. A really good example of that is our lighting filter. So here I choose lighting. I'll make that a bit bigger. And look, I can actually control now the angle and the tilt of that light using Apple Pencil. There's no latency whatsoever. So it's a really immersive way to work. Now, I said at the start I was creating a movie poster. And in fact, what I'm actually doing is creating a pirate movie poster. So now I need a pirate. And I've got Captain Jack Sparrow here. But at the moment, of course, he's on the wrong background. So what I need to do is cut him out. And I'm going to use some selection tools to do that. So to start with, I'm just going to do, and you can see how quick it is to do a really quick selection with pencil to sort of snap around the edges. But of course, with selections, what often happens is you need to do a much more accurate selection around hair. And to do that, we're going to do a selection refinement. This is something that takes a huge amount of CPU power. But on this latest iPad, it's twice as fast as ever before. And you can see pretty much instantly, I get a selection down to individual strands of hair. And that's it. That's my poster complete, a professional looking poster created on a, design, uh, on a device that I can hold in my hands. It's really incredible. I really think that iPad Pro um, alongside uh, Affinity Photo is a truly game-changing experience for professional photo editing. And the best thing of all is that you can now experience it now because I'm delighted to announce that Affinity Photo for iPad is available on the App Store from today. Thank you. Wow. Thank, thank you, Ash. That's amazing performance. Again, especially for a device that's so thin and light and a simple one-pound package you can take with you everywhere you go. And what's also cool is despite all this performance, the new iPad Pro still delivers the same all-day, 10-hour battery life that our iPad users love. Next, let's talk about cameras. The new iPad Pro features the latest camera system from our iPhone 7. That means the same high-performance 12-megapixel sensor with optical image stabilization. And it has the ability to even capture and, of course, edit 4K video on the go. They're absolutely fantastic cameras. The front-facing cameras from the iPhone 7 as well, with all of its great features, like wide color gamut capture, auto image stabilization, and the entire display can light up to become the world's brightest and largest retina flash. We have great accessories as well. The iPad Pro supports USB 3, which means that you're going to get faster transfers with your USB and SD camera adapters. And this also, we also support fast charging, which means any of our USB-C charge adapters will now allow you to charge at half the time. And we have great new smart covers. We have available in polyurethane, and then we're bringing back the popular leather as well. And then we've designed an all-new leather sleeve with a built-in storage for your Apple Pencil. So that's the new iPad Pro family a lineup with the world's most advanced displays, including a brand new 10 and a half inch size and incredibly compact design. 
powerful new A10X fusion chip, incredible new cameras, and of course, as you would expect, we make all these in incredibly environmentally friendly ways. We're also going to double the amount of memory that comes at the beginning of these configurations. Both, both sizes will now start with 64 gigabytes of memory. And the 10 and a half inch with 64 gigs will now be at 649, and it's just $150 more to move up to the bigger uh, display at 799. We're also going to have configurations in 256 and 512 gigabytes, half a terabyte of storage in an iPad. And as always, you can get any of these models with LTE as well. So this is the new iPad Pro. You can order them today. They'll start shipping next week. And of course, because they're shipping now, they're going to ship with iOS 10, but you'll be able to easily update to iOS 11 as a free update this fall. But you haven't heard the full iOS 11 story yet as it relates to iPad. So I'd like to invite Craig back to the stage to tell you about some incredible iPad features coming in iOS 11. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, everybody. Yes, there is more iOS 11. If you love iPad like I do, well, buckle up. For a, you're in for a wild ride. We are taking iOS to the next level. This is the largest iOS release for iPad we've ever done. Now, it starts with the dock. And we all know that dock hovering down there at the bottom of the screen. It is more powerful than ever. You can fill it with apps. On the right, there's a predictive area. Figures out what you're going to use next, including your continuity apps. And now you can summon the dock from anywhere right from the bottom of the screen and use it for switching apps just like that. And what's incredible is how it's used for multitasking. So now if you're in an app and you swipe up, we well, can pull an app out just like that into slide over. Now, of course, you can snap your apps into split view, but what's really cool is the new app switcher because it preserves all of your spaces with your app pairings. It's really great. Now, the iPad, of course, is the ultimate multi-handed, multi-touch device, and so we're so excited to bring drag and drop to iPad. You can drag images, you can drag text, you can drag URLs, you can multi-select and multi-hand drag. It's a drag fest. Now, it's incredibly productive, but of course, sometimes you have to type, and so we made the keyboard even more productive as well. You can now flick on keys to access punctuation and numbers, all without switching planes. It's super fast and super easy. Now, we have a new app to introduce to you today, and it's called Files. <laughs> files brings together all your files on your iPad. It supports everything you'd expect, nested folders, spring loading, list view, favorites, search, tags, and it has this beautiful recents view that pulls it all together across all of your sources because it supports not only iCloud, it also supports third-party storage providers like Box, Dropbox, OneDrive, and Google Drive. And they're all right here in your sidebar. You know what? Let's do a demo. Let's take our first look at iOS 11 on iPad. So here we have our new dock at the bottom. Now I can easily drag right into the dock, just like this. It's a great way to launch apps, as always. But now it's also a great way to switch apps. Just tap like that. Now, if I want to multitask, check this out. Drag it out, it's right there. Now I can slide it off the screen. I can now slide it over here. Both these views are completely live. I can go into split view just like this, but I want you to check out the new app switcher. I'm just going to swipe for up from the bottom and keep swiping. It goes back like that. Let's do that again. That is so great. It's that easy. Now you notice 
our, my spaces are preserved. So over here on the left, I have mail and safari. In split view, I can just tap those open like this. Let's try some drag and drop. So I'm gonna drag a URL from the top of Safari here right into this mail message. Drag it and drop it. Now I can drag it. Yep. Let's drag an image. Yep, just like that. Now, I wanna focus just on mail because I'm gonna show you dragging across spaces. So let's go into photos. I have some uh, great photos here of some potential uh, drone protection options for the new campus. So I'm gonna start a drag, but watch this. With my other hand, I'm gonna tap. I can add to this selection, just like that. And I can even swipe up with my other hand into multitasking. Move over to mail and drop. Now I wanna show you files. I can bring up files, of course, right from the dock in split view, just like this. And it's a great way to deal with attachments because I can take this attachment and this mail message, pick it up, and just drop it right into this folder of top secret projects. Now let's dive all the way in and take a closer look at the Files app. We see it has this uh, gorgeous grid view, but it also has a list view that provides me all the details about my files. I can sort them by size or let's uh, sort by date. Now I can create new folders. Let's say I want to create an R and D folder right here. I'm going to take some of my top secret perspective projects and I can do multi-select just like this, drop them in. Now I can also take the folder, drag it right in to my favorites. And these are synced across all of my devices. And if I want to tag a file, of course I just drag it right on there and make that one important. And you notice in addition to iCloud, here on the left, I've accessed all my cloud providers like Box. So you can see I have files here I'm using and folders that I'm using for collaboration. And that includes this drone defense proposal right here, uh, pr presentation. And I want to show you when I go into the recents view from the tab at the bottom, notice I get a view across everything, including that one uh, inside a Box. I'm going to tap into that keynote presentation. And for my final act, I want to show you how I can use files directly from the dock. Just swipe up. If I tap and hold, I get access to my recent assets. I can just pick this up, drop it down, just like that. And that is a quick demo of our productivity features on iPad. Now, next. I want to talk about Apple Pencil, because Apple Pencil has really created a whole new way of working on iPad, and with iOS 11, we've integrated it deeply into the system. Now, it starts with markup, because you can mark up anything you can quick look. You can take Safari content. We create it into a continuous scrolling view that you can mark up. And you can actually do this with any app that supports printing, because we have a create PDF option that'll create a markup PDF. It's a really great way uh, to mark up anything and share it. And we know a lot of people do like to share with screenshots. And so now, when you take a screenshot, we'll create a thumbnail down on the bottom of the screen. If you tap it, you go instantly into markup. You can mark it up right there and share it. Now, we've all, it's really cool. Now, we've also integrated Pencil deeply into Notes. So if you're working on a note and later you're at the lock screen, you want to get back, just a tap of the pencil to the lock screen and you're right back into your note. And we've made your note handwritten text searchable. So we can now search handwriting. We use deep learning to recognize what you write. And if you're doing um, primarily typed notes, you can now also do inline, draw inline drawings right there. It's, it's very handy. Now, of course, sometimes we still have to deal with paper, so Notes now has a built-in document scanner. It can correct perspective and contrast. And when you bring the note in, you can mark it up right with your pencil. And we've integrated markup into mail as well, so you can personalize your mail messages with inline drawings. Now, for a look at all of these great new pencil features, I'd like to introduce the man who heads iPad software engineering for us, Toby Patterson, for a live demo. Toby. Good morning. Well, the first thing I want to show you is a quick way of getting to your notes using your Apple Pencil. 
you just tap on the lock screen like this, and it slides up to reveal your notes beneath it. Now you can see here I've got a handwritten note, and I wanna show you how easy it is to create one of these. Uh, watch at the top of the note here as I edit the title just by putting the pencil down and writing like this after the 2017 keynote. It's as natural as putting pencil to paper. Now something paper can't help you with is finding your notes again later. We're using machine learning to recognize your handwriting and index it in Spotlight. Let's switch into Spotlight now and we'll search for that text that I just wrote out. You can see here I've got the new flick keyboard which makes it really easy to enter numbers just by swiping down on the keys like this. And you can see there it's already found my note as the top hit even with my atrocious handwriting. We'll just tap on that and we're back at the note. Now, I'm gonna switch to a different note now because I want to show you how you can mix drawing with type text and tables and all of Notes' other great features. This is a note that my young daughter shared with me as part of a school assignment where she had to work with her parents to develop an idea for a new app. Now, she asked me how many copies of our app I thought I might sell, uh, we might sell, and so I wanna quickly draw a graph to give her some idea of that. I'm just gonna press down here with the pencil to make some space for my drawing. And uh, we can take that little grabber and open up some more room. Now, I am really bad at drawing, but I just love doing it. And what's great about drawing on the iPad is it works the same way as it does with paper. And that means it's really easy for me to draw really badly right here. Watch, I'm just gonna put the pencil down and uh, just like that. Zoop. It's so simple, and I think you're gonna have a lot of fun rediscovering the joy of drawing. But uh, let's move on now. So my daughter's learned a few things from me about how Apple works, and before I left this morning, she gave me an NDA to sign. <laughs> I'm gonna use the new document scanner and notes and my pencil to take care of that in a snap. We'll just tap the plus button here to bring up the document scanner, and all I need to do is point the camera at the piece of paper. Notes will take the picture automatically, even straighten the page up. We'll open it up full screen here, and now I just fill in the blanks with my pencil. And just like that, I've got a signed copy of the NDA saved away in my notes. Now, I see my daughter sent me a message, and it must be pretty important if she's interrupting my demo, so if you'll excuse me, I'm just gonna tap on that and see what she has to say. Wow, an offer for $100 million is really pretty thrilling. I'm, I need to send this to my wife right away. I'm gonna take a screenshot of this, and then we'll tap on the thumbnail here to open up our new screenshot editing UI. From here, I can crop it down to just the part of the image that I want to send. I can scribble a quick note with my pencil, and then I can bring up the share sheet to send it off to my wife right away. So these are just a few of the ways that you can use your pencil with your iPad in iOS 11. Back to you now, Craig, thank you. It is so great when your grade school child gets $100 million of funding. They just, they do grow up so fast these days. Well, so these are some of the great new features for the iPad, and of course they're joined by all of these other features you heard from earlier today. We're really excited about what we're doing with iPad this year, and really excited about iOS 11. Now iOS 11 is available to all of you developers today, and if you sign up at beta.apple.com, you can get a beta at the end of the month, and we're making it available as a free upgrade to everyone in the fall, it supports all of these devices. That is your update for iOS 11. I'm going to turn it back over to Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. iOS 11 really takes iPad to a whole new level. People are going to be able to do more in more places than ever before. We've, we are so excited about the marriage of iOS 11 and the new iPad Pro that we made a video, and I'd love to run it for you. The K-12 
keep my hands on myself Think I'll dust them all, put them back up on the shelf Keeps my little baby girl as a knee Am I coming out of left? Ooh, I'm a rebel just for kicks now Let me kick it like it's 1986 Might be over now, I can feel it still We could fight a war for peace I hope you're as excited about the new iPad Pro and iOS 11 as we are. Now, we've got one last thing to talk to you about. <laughs> Let's turn our attention to music. Music has always been a part of Apple's DNA. We first revolutionized the music industry with iTunes. Then we forever change the way people listen to music on the go with the iPod. And today, iPhone has become the best portable music player in the world. And it's even better when it's paired with Apple Music. You now have 40 million songs in your pocket. And when you add AirPods, it brings an absolutely magical experience to wireless audio. Now, so we have such a great portable music experience, but what about our homes? We think we can do a lot to make this experience much better. Just like we did with portable music, we want to reinvent home music. And I'd like to invite Phil up to tell you all about it. Bill. Thank you. This is really exciting. The chance to reinvent the way we enjoy music in the home. I can't think of anything that matters more to so many of us. Why hasn't this happened yet? There certainly are a lot of companies hard at work making products to enjoy music in our home. But none of them have quite nailed it yet. Some have worked hard to make wireless music sound good around our homes. But these aren't smart speakers. Others have worked to make smart speakers that you can talk to. They don't sound so great when you listen to music. We want to combine all this, and the product can really deliver a breakthrough experience. And our team has been hard at work for many years now on a breakthrough home speaker. And it has to do a few things really great if it's going to be a great breakthrough speaker. First, it needs to rock the house. Right? We need to enjoy our music, whatever genre you love, really low or really loud, free from distortion. Second, it needs to be spatially aware. It's going to fit in different rooms in our house, and it needs to be smart enough to know what to do to make the music sound great. Third, it has to be really fun to use. It has to have a built-in musicologist, an expert on music, who can help us to hear the music we love or discover music we're going to love. Now, we're working on this speaker for later this year, but we want to give you, 6,000 of our closest friends, a sneak peek at it this morning. And here it is. It is 
absolutely beautiful, and we call it HomePod. Yes. Just like iPod reinvented music in our pockets, HomePod is going to reinvent music in our homes. So let's talk about these features. First, rock the house. The HomePod is just under seven inches tall. It's covered in a seamless 3D mesh fabric that has incredible acoustic properties. And it hides within it amazing audio technology. For example, along the bottom is a seven array beamform tweeter pack that's packed with seven tweeters, each with their own individual driver. They have precision acoustic horns that drive the audio from within and then out along the bottom with tremendous directional control. And that'll become really clear in a bit as we talk about how it works. It has a really big woofer, a four inch woofer, upward facing with a large motor to move a lot of air. That's automatic bass equalization and dynamic software modeling so that as we turn the volume up, it's free from distortion. And all of this is controlled by an Apple A8 chip. Yes, the same chip that powers the inside of our iPhone is inside HomePod. It's perhaps the biggest brain ever in a speaker. And it does some incredible things. It does real-time acoustic modeling, audio beamforming, and multi-channel echo cancellation. You don't have to know what any of that is, just know that it sounds incredible. Next, talk about this spatial awareness. What does that mean? Well, you plug in your HomePod to AC, and it gets its music wirelessly. And it's compact enough that you can put it most anywhere in your house. You can put it on a table, on a shelf, against the wall, in a corner, and it intelligently and automatically detects the space it's within. And it uses that information to adjust the audio, to balance it, and take full advantage of the environment and create a very spacious sound. Now, we want to give you a sense of what that experience is like. So we want to play some music in this room and show you a visual simulation to give you an understanding of some of the technologies it's using and how it's adapting them to make an incredible sound out of this compact speaker. So we're going to start by playing an audio track, and it'll be a full mix, and then we're going to break it down into some of the components that the HomePod controls. So that's a full, rich audio mix. But within it, HomePod detects the center vocals and can use beamforming to direct that. It gives incredible clarity and precision. And then it can detect something called direct energy with the instrumentation and direct that in the room as well. In addition to that direct energy, there's something that's usually missing in music, ambient audio, the backing vocals and reverb. HomePod can direct all of this and pull it together to a full rich mix that fills up your room. It's a really remarkable experience to hear this kind of a spacious sound come from such a compact speaker. And if you love one, you should see what it's like when you set up two and they automatically work together to give this incredible spacious sound that really is the power to rock your house. Next, a musicologist, this intelligent helper to help us discover the music we love. HomePod has an incredible speaker system that works together with our Apple Music subscription. From the beginning, it's designed to work with that. Now, Apple Music, as you know, provides music in the cloud, and the speaker can get it directly from the cloud. You can get 40 million tracks 
two million artists, tens of thousands of playlists, but not just any music library. This is your music library. It knows the playlists you've set up. It knows the artists you love, and all of them stream directly to your home pod. It works with an array of six microphones around the middle. So as you talk to it and you say those magic words, hey Siri, you see a waveform light up on top, and now it can respond to your commands and help serve up the music you want to hear. The Siri team has worked very hard to adapt the domain of music and Siri to be even greater and understand more of the questions we're going to ask about music. Simple things, obviously, like play Beats One Radio. We all want to do that. Or play Unpoppy. Check it out if you don't know what that's about. <laughs> play something new. Who's singing on this track? Something I ask all the time. Who's playing drums on this track? The complex questions like, what was the top song on May 5th, 2016? Or just play more like that, or I like that song. It's a free form. Siri doesn't need a specific list of commands. It can interpret what you're saying and help you discover the music you love. And even better, you don't have to just sit next to the HomePod to talk to it. You can be across the room and speak to the HomePod even while loud music is playing and the speaker array and the microphones can, can pick it up and hear what you're saying. So HomePod has the power to rock the house. It has spatial awareness so that it understands the rooms we place it within. And it has the fun interactivity of Siri becoming a musicologist and helping us to listen to the music we love. And since Siri's built in there and you can speak to it, well, the team's also worked hard to make it a great and helpful home assistant as well. We said the domain of music is something Siri knows really well in HomePod. There are other domains as well. We've worked hard to pick the first ones that we think matter most in a product like HomePod. So of course, you can play your podcasts. But it can also do things like give you news, give you weather, traffic, sports. You can ask it to set a reminder, set a timer, text someone with messages. And if you have HomeKit devices set up in your home, you can speak to your HomePod and control your HomeKit devices. So for example, with the HomePod set up, you can say, when do the Red Sox play next? They're going to beat the Yankees, trust me. Tune to NPR instead. Flip a coin. Remind me to bring snacks to a party. You can set up reminders, check all these sports news and weather, all directly with your voice. Talk to a HomePod to get the information directly from the cloud. And if you have HomeKit devices set up, you can say simple things like, are the lights on? Turn the heat up. Turn on the air conditioning. Bring the shades down halfway. Turn off the lights in the bedroom. And if you've set up scenes in HomeKit, you can control those as well. You can say, I'm home. It's movie time. I'm leaving now. And the whole scene can automatically happen just by talking to your HomePod. And because there is a HomePod uh, base, a HomeKit base built into HomePod, that means anywhere in the world, once you've set up your first HomePod, you control your HomeKit devices remotely using the built-in Home app on your iPhone or iPad. Now, setting up a HomePod and its microphone array in your home, you probably have a question that we've worked really hard to deal with, which is privacy. Our team cares deeply about your privacy. So for example, it has that magic phrase, hey Siri. Until you say it, nothing's being sent to Apple. It recognizes when you do say it, and from that point, it sends an anonymous Siri ID in order to help you with the commands you're looking for. And of course, that communication is all encrypted. So this is the HomePod. It's a breakthrough home speaker. Typically, Wi-Fi speakers, if they're a good quality, are 300 to $500. And a smart speaker might cost you 100 to $200. So it's not unreasonable for a HomePod to be priced in the range of $400 to $700. So we're really excited to tell you that HomePod is going to be priced for $349. It comes in white and space gray. It'll start shipping this December, first in the US, the UK, and Australia. And then next year, we'll start bringing it around the world. So that's HomePod. Back to you, Tim. Thank you. It is so cool 
We really believe it's going to take your home music experience to the next level. Now, it's been an incredible morning. We've shared with you lots of things this morning, and all of them are shipping this year. Some now, some in the fall, and others at the end of the year. We got started with watchOS, more intuitive and intelligent than ever before, incredible new features to help us live a healthier life. Mac OS High Sierra, great refinements and technologies that will push the Mac OS experience forward. Updates to MacBook, MacBook Pro, and iMac, faster and more capable than ever before. And iOS 11, a major update of the world's best and most advanced mobile operating system, absolutely jam-packed with new features, including a completely new app store, peer-to-peer -peer payments in Apple Pay, and with ARKit, iOS 11, becomes the world's largest augmented reality platform overnight. iPad is taken to a whole new level with incredible iPad features in iOS 11. It's the biggest release for iPad ever. And of course, a new lineup of iPad Pro with an all new perfect 10.5 inch size with advanced displays, powerful new features, that enable people to do more with their iPads than ever before. And we gave you two sneak peeks. iMac Pro, an entirely new workstation class of products that we designed specifically for our Pro users. And the HomePod, a breakthrough home speaker with amazing sound and incredible intelligence. It will reinvent home audio. Now, we have a hands-on area for the press set up to, uh, to attend immediately after the keynote. And for all developers, we welcome you to come by from 4 to 7 p.m. this evening. We've got over 100 sessions planned for you this week and over 1,000 Apple engineers here to spend time with you, so take advantage of, of the time. Tomorrow, we've got a special fireside chat planned in the morning in this room. And someone will be joining us that's devoted her entire career to highlighting and encouraging young people, women, and doers. I'm very excited to tell you that Michelle Obama will join us. She'll be joining us for the open session in this room tomorrow, and she'll be talking about empowering people from all walks of life to change the world. This is a very special treat, and I encourage everyone to come. I hope everyone here has a fantastic week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.